Greetings friends, today I have an important video for axe users, people that make their own axe handles, axe manufacturers, and axe handle manufacturers. What I'm offering you today is largely uh, theories that are based on experience and intuition and logic. I am not an engineer. I am not a scientist. I can operate in that mode. I can be a scientist, but in this case and in most cases I choose not to. If you want objective proof, of this uh, don't feel entitled to insist that I give it to you. Today we're talking about design. We're not talking about grain orientation or general wood quality. If I make comparisons between two handles we're going to assume that those two pieces of wood are essentially exactly the same in their characteristics. When it comes to axe handles, stress happens. It just happens even in normal use, let alone abuse. The stress is also vary quite a bit, you know, in different directions and different types like sudden or gradual and etc. Now there are inherent problems with this tool consisting of an axe head and a handle, and we can't fix all of those. All we can do is kind of ameliorate some of them to a great degree. Both Dudley Cook and Peter Vito have actually documented the, the increase in thickness, the average thickness of axe handles over decades. So, you know, they started out at a certain thickness and they've just gradually gotten thicker and thicker to the point where now uh, that some of the examples are just really extreme. Now presumably people are making axe handles thicker so that they are quote-unquote stronger. If I take a piece of wood that's say two and a half feet long and an inch and a half thick and I put it between two stumps so it's suspended in the air and I stand on it, I'm going to bounce on that with my 160 pounds and it's not going to break. If I start trimming a little bit off at a time it's going to start flexing more, more and more and more and more and then eventually it's going to break. And yeah, it is stronger when you're bouncing up and down on it, but it doesn't take into account the axe as a system of different parts and like some of the design limitations we have on any given axe. And strength is really kind of a sloppy concept here. We want resiliency. We're looking at a whole system here. We have the axe head mated with the handle and there's certain design limitations that are set and we need to work within those to make a tool that's resilient and resiliency to stress and overall strength of any given part of the axe are not at all the same thing. We want to look at things like stress distribution and how stress uh, stacks up or is distributed and that's what we're talking about today. With this tool we have two very dissimilar materials joined together. We have a very hard material that doesn't flex and has a high mass and then we have a low mass here but a material that's much more flexible, although it's much weaker. Now joining these two very dissimilar materials in the system that is an axe creates some inherent problems. For instance, this material is much harder and less flexible than this material. So if I bend this handle against this hard edge right here, say at the eye, that stacks up stress there and makes a point that's essentially vulnerable. So if I have any given axe head, let's say this axe head, and I want to put a handle on it, there's two things I'm probably not going to change. The weight of the axe and the size and shape of the eye. Now this is super important. The size and shape of the eye are fixed. Look at the handle. Look at what you can change and not change. We're going to design around the fact that the eye is a fixed size. I have two axes drawn on the chalkboard here. These are theoretical extremes. Uh, that's because sometimes when you take things to extremes, it helps you understand how things work. So let's assume that these two axes are the same, the eyes are the same size. This is uh, much, much thicker than the eye, and the whole handle is very thick. And this one's exactly the same thickness. It comes out of the eye and it goes straight, all the same thickness down here. Now I want you to imagine taking both of these axes, each in turn, and slamming the side of the head against a tree, like this. Now that's going to create an impact that essentially is in this direction here. Now what's going to happen with these two? The body of the handle of this axe is going to flex a lot more than the body of the handle of this axe. This is hardly going to flex at all. This is going to flex a whole lot. It could look something like an even bow. So when either one of these hits the tree, some of the energy is going to be absorbed into the tree, obviously. Uh, this mass is quite heavy. It's going to hit the tree and bounce and bounce backward like this. And the mass of each handle is going to try to keep going this way. This mass is going to try to keep going. And on this thick handle, since it's over twice the mass of this handle, we'll draw a big fat arrow there for this mass trying to continue that way. And then we'll draw a little bit smaller arrow for this one. So this is regular old momentum or inertia. Things that are in motion want to stay in motion. The heavier and faster the thing is, the more it wants to stay in motion and keep going this way. So essentially what we're looking at here now is we're going to look at stress distribution. So a certain amount of stress is going to be in this, this whole system. And in this, a lot of that is taken up by this flex. 
this distributes the stress more evenly along here and less here. This is still a high stress point, so we'll draw a bigger arrow there. Now on this handle, the stress distribution is very poor and we get a stacking of stress right here, which viewers have told me is called a stress riser or stress razor, you can look it up. It's an engineering concept. So as you can see, this is more likely to form a hinge right here where this just bends and snaps off. Now let's do something different with these. Let's take a large stump that's not gonna move and we're gonna stick each head in it like side by side and we're gonna drive those heads in real deep so the heads aren't going anywhere. And then we're gonna push on the end of this and we're gonna push on the end of that. Think about what's gonna happen there. It's the same concept. We're gonna have a hinge point here that stacks up stress. And let's flip this totally around and instead of saying, oops, we made an accident, look what's gonna happen. Let's say we wanted to take a wooden ax handle of this length in this head and design it to maximize stress in this area. Well, what we do is make it as thick as possible so it wouldn't bend at all. And then we just have a super efficient way to break that off. You know, when we start to thin this down, the problem becomes less and less so, but that's because it's distributing stress. So that's what we're going to be looking at from here out. And now we have another theoretical extreme here and a more normal axe here. Let's take a look at this, several interesting points. So there's two things we need to look at that are uh, sort of constants. One is that this is going to be wider than the rest of the handle, or the handle is going to be really uncomfortable to use because we know the eye is really wide and it's wide for a reason, so it's stronger but there's a difference between the size of this and the size of this. We also know that this has to come out of the eye and come out a little bit, so it rise, there's a riser like this, and that's because when we put the head on, we want it to snug down, right? We don't want to make it exactly the same size. Also, if the wood shrinks in the future, we want to be able to jump this down, you know, at least like three eighths, maybe even a half an inch, so that we can tighten it up. So we want a slope that comes out a little bit this way. Now imagine if we made an ax like this. We have the same problem. This is a stress riser right here, a stress raiser. It raises the stress. There's a big difference in mass and behavior between this piece of wood up here, this section, and this section. Now let's say that uh, we thin this down to where it's comfortable and it works well like that. This is gonna flex, that's not. Now when we cut this, the grain is running through the handle this way, right? So we violated the grain and cut across it and we just sliced right across it and we made this sharp angle and this right here is a very common place for axe handles to break right here right along that line where we violate the grain but by distributing that stress out we can largely avoid this problem so in this axe this comes out and then there's a gradual taper here and that gradual taper yes we're still going to have a high point of stress somewhere in here. It's relatively large, but we're also gonna take some of that stress and we're gonna distribute it out along this curve. Now, I just knew this by intuition and by using tools and understanding how other things work, but if you look it up, they'll tell you exactly this. If you're making a, a metal part, say, and it goes like this, and there's a sharp shoulder here, that's weak. And if you make it like this with a little bit of a curve, even a small curve right here, it makes it much stronger. So essentially the way I see this is working is that if we make this longer, the longer we make it, the more gradual we make it, the more gentle the transition, the less stress up to a point. You know, I mean, at some point you're gonna have to get into formulas and stuff that doesn't really matter that much to us, but essentially bad, better. Is this a fix for the whole problem? No, it's still inherently a problem. It's just less of a problem. We get the same effect right here where we've come out and then suddenly we dive in and go into the eye. I see new axes with this uh, frequently, bad idea. Again, same thing, let's say we chop into a piece of wood so we have stress kind of coming this way. This is just gonna be prone to unzipping right at that point. So if we look at the back of the ax, again, we have the same problem here. And you'll see this a lot where this comes down, it's really thin, this, this spot's really thin and then it suddenly dives out at a sharp angle and this is super thick and it's gonna stack up stress right here. If we come out of the eye very gently, again, another thing we need is a slight angle out this way. You see how this comes out just a little bit? That again is so that we can drive the ax head down and seat it really well and then if it comes loose, we have another you know, half inch or so here to drive it down further in the future. Other than that, we don't really need much up here and it's not gonna actually make it stronger in my opinion, to make it just thicker. In fact, it's going to
cause stress to stack up here instead of distributing it along here. So I want to see this portion of the eye, which is fixed again, this is like we're kind of designing around that, be not that much different than the rest of the handle. So this axe would be a good example of these theories in practice. This comes up real gradually right in here, right? So this stress riser is reduced because it bends gradually and not suddenly. In other words, we've partly neutralized the behavioral difference between this area of the handle and this area of the handle when it's stressed. Looking at it this way, the thickness of the handle is about three quarters of an inch, which is not all that much thicker than the eye at this point right here. And then this is slightly thicker than the eye as well, but it's not a lot thicker and it's thick enough. In continuing to look at this axe as a whole system, when I use this axe, this whole handle is gonna flex because it's quite thin and flexible. So again, that's gonna take stress off of the eye as well. You know, the handle's gonna bend instead of just acting as a stiff lever to apply more stress in this area. At least that's my theory. Now, you don't wanna approach this entirely from a theoretical standpoint because we also have ergonomics. So you wanna make the thing work for you. There may be a theoretical ideal that you could you know, experiment and calculate where say this is gonna you know, do something really specific, but it has to be comfortable. I handle my ax right up here all the time. If I plan to use a small ax with one hand up here a lot, then I want that to be comfortable. So we could make the handle completely straight but that may not serve you the best. Maybe we want some curve in there, even if it theoretically would weaken the handle to a small extent. We're dealing with you know real life and not just armchair theory. Let's do a quick recap. We can't fix all the problems with this design. Some of them are inherent. We're just trying to make them better. Handle thickness has been increasing over time, but eye thickness has not been increasing, and this creates problem. The idea that you can make the body of the handle thicker and decrease breakage is misguided and it's just faulty logic because it doesn't take into account the whole axe as a system and the stresses applied and how those stresses are distributed or not. Make the main body of the handle reasonably flexible so that it shares some of the stress and removes some of the stress from this area. Try not to make huge differences in mass, flexibility, and thickness between different parts of the handle. So in other words, don't have a giant chunk of inflexible wood here and then have this part be really thin. When you do have differences in mass and shape and all that that are unavoidable, try to make the transition smooth. Now one last note is that I hear a lot of people say they don't like thin handles because it doesn't give them the control they need to control the ax or you know they want to have a good grip on it. Well under most circumstances if you're chopping, limbing, splitting firewood and all that, you don't want to grab this heavy anyway, and the handle is really just a guide to whip or throw the axe head into the work. By the time the thing hits the wood, you should be kind of like have a pretty light grip on the thing. Now, of course, context is king, and some people do have really large hands, but keep in mind all of the burly lumberjacks of the past to chop down the forests of North America using thin handled axes. You shouldn't need any kind of particularly strong grip on the axe, and it shouldn't be difficult to guide and control the direction of an axe with a thin handle. Okay, so clearly I think these are important factors in axe handle design and function and resiliency and breakage and lack of breakage or I would not make this video. I also think they're pretty hard to argue with, but feel free, that's what the comments are for, but make a point, you know, make a real point, not just I disagree with you and not, oh, prove it, you have to prove it. Oh, I'm not gonna prove it, this is what you get. What you see is what you get, however, these concepts, while they seem solid enough to me, are quantitative. Like, at what point do these things become a problem, right? There's a big difference between this and this. And in actual function, you know, we could debate pretty endlessly and test extensively at what point this becomes a problem. In my personal experience, I like this type of a configuration where there's very little difference. I really minimize the difference between the size of the eye here and the size of the rest of the handle and make these transitions long and smooth. But I hope you can see clearly that at some point these things become a problem. And finally, no matter how well designed this is, how flexible, how you know resilient by design and how well it shares the stress, you can still break it pretty easy because it has an inherent weakness to the system. 
And that means that technique is all important. There's no substitute for spending a lot of time on the working end of an axe to get your aim down, make sure your angles are right, and just spending a lot of time with an axe so that you understand what you can and cannot get away with. All right, so happy chopping. Be careful out there. These things are very dangerous. Uh, doing the cordwood challenge over two years now, I think we've probably had, I'm thinking maybe six people have cut themselves. And this isn't among very many participants, either in the foot or the leg. And most of those, almost all of those had stitches. This tool is no joke, man. A heavy, you know, sharp thing on the end of a stick, it's just a recipe for disaster.